Welcome to Science Gallery Detroit's webinar with Veronda Montgomery. Today we are talking with Dr. Veronda Montgomery about her book, Lessons from Plants. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And if you have any questions that you want to add to the chat, please add them in the chat and we will talk about them throughout our conversation today. So in honor of Earth Day, um, our conversation will begin. But first, a special thanks to our sponsors at MSU FCU and Science Sandbox. So, Veronda Montgomery, can you give us a little bit about yourself? Just a quick little brief overview. Sure. So I always like to start with the fact that I'm the daughter of Ernestine and Willie Montgomery and the mother of Nicholas Kaguri. Those are my greatest gifts on the planet. Um, I'm a scientist for 17 years at Michigan State University. I'm a writer for longer than that, um, but I've been studying plants for about 25 years, trying to understand basically how they amazingly exist on the planet, know who they are, what they are, and what they should be doing. And we study mostly light in my lab. And I also have the privilege to teach and mentor and to be an academic leader at Michigan State. So what Veronda did not mention is all of her <laughs> accolades. Um, so let me brag on Veronda for Veronda. Um, Veronda is named one of the nation's 100 inspiring black scientists by Cell Press Magazine's uh, Crosstalk. She is an NSF Career Award recipient. She is a recent fellow from, she received a recent fellowship from the National American Association for the Advancement of Science. And recently she had a, a articles published in Nature Magazine and Elle Magazine. Um, that's the quick, quick highlights. Veronda has so much more accolades than that. Uh, we'd be here all day, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna just keep it right there. We'll kind of go through a couple more of them as we continue to talk. So um, questions we want to know. Um, your title at MSU is Foundations Professor. Can you kind of tell us what is a Foundations Professor? What do you do? We hear you discussing plants. You're in a lab. You're looking at stuff under the microscope. But what is that exactly? Yeah, so the MSU Foundation Professor is a special designation. So um, you start at MSU as an assistant professor. That's when you're basically on a probationary period where they give you a time to show that you can uh, do uh interesting research that you can teach well and that you can mentor students. And about six, five to seven years in, they decide if you're doing that well enough that they give you tenure, which is basically a lifetime appointment unless you do something that's really egregious. And so at that point, you're an associate professor. Um, after five more years, I was promoted to full professor, which is generally the final stage of being a professor where you have more rights and responsibilities. But occasionally there's what's called an endowed professorship where people who are doing creative work in a number of areas um, get an endowment. In this case, it's funded by the MSU um, Foundation, the Michigan State University Foundation. Um, and the, the endowment allows you to do some creative experiments uh, that you don't have to make a strong case for with the federal government, like we usually fund research. So it really is a recognition that you've shown enough creativity that they wanna give you some support, some support to continue to do that. So it is, it's allowed me to ask some interesting questions. It's allowed me to do things like writing, and other creative activities. Wow. So one thing you shared, um, not just before um, us talking, but I've heard you talk about it in uh, previous interviews. You're not from Michigan. So what made you pick no. Michigan State University? 
You could win. Yeah, so I am a proud native of Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, and my family, most of my family, my late father and my mother still there. Um, so I'm a Southern Belle. Most people don't get this because I'm not a very good Southern Belle, but I'm technically a Southern Belle. Um, and I basically, um, I followed around the U.S. like a lot of academicians do, following my passion. So I did my undergraduate work in St. Louis, which wasn't very far away from home. And then ultimately, once I decided to do graduate studies in the plant sciences, I did my graduate work in California at the University of California, Davis, which is one of the premier places to do plant science. And when I was looking for a job, I was looking for a place that is deeply invested in the plant sciences, has lots of good colleagues, and Michigan State University and the plant research lab where I work are a really excellent place, a lot of support to do the plant sciences. So it was the work and the possibility to do the work that brought me to Michigan and has kept me here despite the fact that winter is still not native to me in any kind of way, um, but the work has kept me here. Amazing. Well, we are so glad to have you. I'm glad to have met you. Um, you're one of my personal heroes. Um, oh, I've been you. telling everybody about this interview um, leading up to it. I was like, okay, for me, there is uh, <laughs> Obama, uh, Oprah Winfrey, Stacey Abrams, Stacey Adams, and Stacey Abrams, excuse me, yes. and then Veranda Montgomery. Um, and to like know you like in, real, in the flesh, um, like you're such a heavyweight in the plant world. That means a huge, huge deal to me. Um, so Thank I'm you. just glad to have you and to know you, to make your acquaintance. Um, so we share a common interest and what made you interested in plants in the first place? Like what made you interested in plants? And then what made you pivot into actually studying plant right now? Yeah, so it's interesting because I think a lot of times we don't recognize the roots of our interest um, at the time, but I grew up, my mother has an amazing green thumb. Um, I really didn't appreciate the value of her connection with plants, but the home that we grew in was filled with plants. Her home is still filled with plants and our our neighborhood, in our neighborhood, her gardens, her flower gardens, her vegetable gardens were just like the star of the neighborhood. So I watched her engaging with plants a lot when I was young and we would help her in the garden, but I wasn't really, it wasn't like a passion of mine at that time. Um, I had thought that I was going to be a lawyer all the way through undergrad, but became really interested. Yeah, I declared when I was five, I was going to be a lawyer because I had this little incident in the neighborhood and I wanted a lawyer to sue the neighbor. And my parents said they weren't going to get me a lawyer. So I was like, well, then I'm going to be a lawyer because future five-year-olds are going to need some pro bono lawyering. But I actually stuck with that over the years because all the aptitude tests showed that I had all the, you know, verbal skills and writing skills that a good lawyer would make. Uh, but it was in middle school that I got really interested in sciences. And it was later. I never thought about doing the plant sciences, never even thought about, um, plants, or, I mean, research as a career, I thought at that point I would be a biological patent lawyer. So I was still sticking with the law and trying to you know, marry it with my interest in science. But ultimately, I did love doing hands-on experiments um, when I got a chance to do that. And it became clear to me, I had known no one who was a professor, so I didn't know it was a possibility. Once knowing the possibility, I started to really be excited about that and took some classes. And I took a plant physiology class and I thought plants were boring, but this class really opened my eyes up to all the exciting lives that plants have. And so over the years, as I've gotten back into this, I have reflected back on how the roots of that love were watching my mother. And then at some point I was able to start to really understand the science behind the things I saw her demonstrating in her care of plants when I was growing up. Wow, what an amazing, amazing, amazing journey. And from there, you, we have a whole Dr. Baranda Montgomery. So thank you for sharing that. Um, um, you're one of the co-organizers of Black Botanist Week. Um, yeah. Can you share what kind of, what inspired that? What brought it on? Sure. So last summer in June of 2020, after the murder of George Floyd, on that same day, if you remember, there was an incident in New York City in Central Park where uh, Christian Cooper uh, had an encounter with a white woman and she weaponized her whiteness against him. He was there birding. And in the wake of all of that uh, heightened awareness on anti-Black racism, there was a group that did Black Birders Week. And it was just to really recognize how Black people, like anybody else, enjoy being in nature. But often we have these encounters that are based on who we are, very unfortunate encounters. 
So Tanisha Williams, who is a plant scientist and a postdoc at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania, sent out a call to see if there were any scientists or plant scientists who would be interested in following the model of Black Birders Week to do Black Botanist Week. And um, so I joined the founding committee of that and was really wanting to be a part of it because it was a multi-generational group of people from uh, some teachers, uh, graduate students, all the way. I probably was the oldest one in the group, the senior professor. But I always think, you know, in the work that I've watched in terms of organizing, there's a lot of power in multi-generational groups. And so I really was uh, honored that they had invited me to participate in it. And we, even though most of us work as plant scientists, we wanted to open it up to anybody, any Black person um, who loved plants and others who wanted to support and be in allyship with those Black people who love plants. And so we didn't know what was going to happen. It was just the second of such weeks. It ended up being a whole year long of Black and whatever science weeks. But it was a lot of fun. We had little four and five-year-old girls in Detroit posting pictures of themselves in their gardens and saying, I'm a Black botanist too. And that's what we wanted to really... I think about it as reclaiming part of the history that Black people have with plants in this country. Too frequently, we think about Blacks and plants um, in the unfortunate history of enslavement and our working in plant fields. But we worked in those fields because we were experts. And so we wanted to reclaim some of our expertise and our, our legacy um, of Black being Black people who love plants. That's powerful. Um, I want to uh, remind anybody who's just joining us to please add any questions you may have for Dr. Barack Montgomery in the chat. Um, I'm going to continue to ask that uh, Black Botanist Week really grew legs, not just on Twitter, but also on Instagram. But um, while we're talking about social media, you are pretty vocal on Twitter. Um, so can you kind of share beyond you being a writer, beyond you being involved in science and plants, and um, you also make time to kind of mentor and also speak out against inequality. Um, so what, what, how do you, one, <laughs> how do you make the time uh, to also speak out for the inequality? And also like what inspires that, that, um, that fervor? Yeah, so I think part of it, um, we make time for what's important for us. And I think it's important for me. It's always been my goal that any kind of success I had wasn't success for me alone. It was success for me, my ancestors, my family, and others who are coming behind me and to honor those who went before. And so for me, I always feel that if I gain a platform, the platform is not to stand there in pride over having gained the platform, is to use it for something. And so it's important to me, and I think it's particularly important for me, um, that the success I've had as a Black woman in science not be evidence that the system works, but that I also talk about how, even though I've had success, how I've had success. And I think too frequently um, it can, those of us who have success can be paraded as evidence that the system works. And what I always say to people is that you can look at the CV and perceive success, but you haven't looked at me to see how I got there, whether I had scars and damage along the way. And even if I didn't, were there others who did? And so I think it's important to talk about my whole experience, not just what people see in terms of the awards and the accolades, but they hear about the challenges. They hear about the challenges that I still see. And I think that not everybody feels um, they can take the risk to say those things. And I feel that I can. So I feel that it's important that I do so. And the way I ended up on Twitter was not any, um, I'm actually, I wasn't a social media person. I've never been on Facebook or anything like that, but I was working with a group of people about five or six years ago, periodically. And they indicated they wanted to stay connected between the time. And I said, well, how would we do that? We're going to do a listserv or what we're going to do. And they looked at me like, you poor old lady, we don't we young people don't do listservs. We are on Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> and so Twitter was the least painful way for me at the time. It was 140 characters. It didn't require a lot of time. And it, it was a platform that ultimately me ultimately allowed me to connect with other people like-minded. And so it served me well. And I think it's about finding the platforms that serve you well and speaking up because I didn't get here alone. I'm not gonna stay here alone. So I can't just collect the accolades without also taking the responsibility that comes with being in the place that I'm in. That's powerful. That's powerful. I think um, just to add on that, I think what happens a lot of times as we grow in these spaces, a lot of us, you know, it is easier to just celebrate our wins and not speak about the the uh, the, the things that we had to overcome to get in those spaces and stay in those spaces. So um, you create a great model 
for how to do that. So um, again, a huge, huge, huge thanks uh, for that. Um, my next question to you is not only, again, like Veronica, you juggle a lot. <laughs> So you also sit on the board for Science Gallery International. And for those who don't know, Science Gallery um, is part of an international network of other galleries around the globe. So our founding gallery is in Dublin, Ireland. Um, they started uh, well over 10 years ago now. And we've since have eight galleries in the network across the world. Um, science Galleries are brought to you by universities. Um, Michigan State brought the first science gallery to the Americas. With that said, um, we have science galleries in London. We have science galleries in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, we have a science gallery in Bengaluru, um, the Netherlands, and so on and so forth. So all that to say, Miranda sits on the board of Science Gallery International. Um, so can you kind of share with us, what do you envision uh, for yourself in that role? Yeah, so I was really excited about the invitation and the opportunity because of the experiences that I've had with Science Gallery Detroit. So I've been a fan of and active in Science Gallery Detroit probably since before it started. I was at one of the first meetings with Jeff when, he, when they were talking about bringing it, Jeff Grable, when they were talking about bringing it to MSU. And if it was Jeff, we probably were in a bar uh, having a conversation about um, <laughs> Science Gallery Detroit. And so from the very beginning, I just saw the potential uh, impact that it could have to bring together communities, really thinking about the interface of science and art and, and anything that centers young people. So I've been impressed by the work that Science Gallery Detroit has done. And then last year, when the pandemic first emerged, I saw one of the collaborations, I think it was around grief. T. Miller and others were leading, a, they were part of this you know, collaboration across the network. And I saw the power of collaborating across the network on topics that have relevance to all of us. But also I was listening to them talk about where they wanna go next and whether there, were, there was gonna be science gallery in the global South or in Africa. And those are spaces that I've worked a lot. I've worked a lot in East Africa and other places. Um, and I think that, you know, in some ways people think about, you know, what can science gallery bring to those areas? Having worked in those areas, I'm really excited about what the potential of having some of those people at the table could bring to science gallery. So I'm really interested in the reciprocity that can come from looking at new places, but also the power to collaborate across the network on some powerful topics. And one thing, if none of us have really understood before that this pandemic has taught us, is how connected we are. We've seen the connection because of the virus moving between us, but there are other potential good things that could also be moving between us, but we have to have those networks and communications and conversations in place. And I think that SGI has some real power in that space. And so I wanna be at the table to bring another diverse perspective as we're thinking about things that could be collaborated across the network. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, they got the right person at the table. So there's a question in the chat. Did you see mm -hmm. or were you aware of the New York Times documented uh, Siege Treasure Hunt? Um, there was a recent article. Um, the New York Times kind of gave a shout out to MSU. Um, so oh yeah, actually, I know. I know the people involved in that, and they still—they won't even tell me. I know the people who secretly went and dug up that bottle, and they won't even tell me where the bottles are on campus. But that is a beautiful experiment where we're getting to see just how the longevity of seeds over time. Um, and so, yeah, it was a really nice story that highlighted some of the long-term work that's been going on here at MSU. Absolutely, absolutely, I love it. I love it. And someone asked, "Do you interact with the?" with the Black Farmers and National Organization of Professional Black Natural, ah, my word, excuse me, <laughs> Black yes. Natural Resources Conservation Service employees. Yeah, so some of the Black farmers and some other groups have reached out to the Black uh, Botanist Week Committee over this past year. And so we are um, in the early stages of planning, you know, the next year of that. And so there are, we're hoping to collaborate with some more groups like that, because I think there's a lot of power, both from the current perspective, but also the history uh, that sits in those particular communities. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So now for the questions we've been waiting for. <laughs> so, yes, <the> book. <laughs> what inspired this wonderful book? This book is deep. So I just want to know what brought all of this on. Obviously, being in a, you know, looking under microscopes and things of that sort, but just tell us 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. So my first kind of experiences of sharing lessons from plants came from almost um, an urgency to have certain conversations about change we need to see in the world around diversity, around equity, around community. And too frequently, we talk ourselves out of doing the work because it's too difficult. And then I look at the way that humans interact with plants and I'm like, there is so much power there in the ways that humans engage with plants. And, you know, we were talking about gardening. We get excited about growing plants and taking care of plants. We get very sad if we're not doing it in a way that results in outcomes that we want to see. And it just felt to me that there is so much power in the ways in which humans engage with plants as well as the natural world to really push some conversations to get us to think deeper, deep, differently about what change is possible in the world. That I started sharing lessons from plants with people really because some of the conversations we need to have when we focus on ourselves, like if we're talking about race, if I'm talking to a white person about race, most of the time there's a fear that I'm about to call them racist. They can't even really hear what I'm saying waiting on that. Whereas if we're just talking about what we expect about plant growth and whether we expect the plants to grow or whether we're giving them what we need, we get deep into the conversation before it becomes personal. So it felt like a way to get a, urgently at having some conversations that I was interested in having and realizing that people would be taken in by talking about the plants and humans first before I had to say to them, you know, you're the one killing the plants and the plants are your neighbors. And so how do we talk about it in that context? So I think I'm inspired by knowledge in the natural world, but I'm also inspired by the power that these analogies can give us to really have some deep conversations about tough issues before we take we get personal and defensive. Mm, I love it. I love that. I love that. So someone asked in the chat, what is the biggest lesson you've learned from plants? So one of, I mean, there are so many lessons, but one that I have been focused on a lot recently is the ways in which plants speak when they're in stress and ask for help, right? And so what do I mean by that? If plants are being um, damaged by herbivores, if they're being eaten on by insects, they make, they speak, there's a communication, they produce a volatile. So, you know, if you open perfume, you smell the smell, that's a volatile compound. If plants are being attacked, they produce this volatile and other plants in the environment pick that up and realize that danger is present and they can start to prepare themselves for danger. And so in some ways they are warning their neighbors and in other ways, when they're in danger, they can ask for help. So one principle of plants is that sometimes they themselves can't defend themselves against damage, but if they're being attacked by a bug that they don't have any defense for, sometimes they can attract a third party. They can say help and a third party that uses that insect as prey will come in and eat it. And so I think this fact that plants ask for help when they're in distress and help comes has been really powerful for me. And it makes me think about Audre Lorde who says, you know, if we're silent, that that's where the danger is. There's power in not being silent. And so I think this ability to speak and declare when you are in distress happens with plants. And that's fascinating to me because too frequently we as humans suffer in silence. Oh. I mean, I don't suffer in silence too much. You already talked about my Twitter, but <laughs> I think that, you know, sometimes we do struggle asking for help when we need it. And I think that's a powerful lesson that we can learn from plants and also to collaborate. If we're in danger, tell your neighbor that there's danger so that they can also prepare. And I think that that power of community, but also the power of speaking um, is really powerful for me. That's huge. So in your book, and to, I'm going to just carry that on, in your book, you talk about plants' ability to teach us a sense of being. Yes. In that sense, you're kind of talking about plants show us a way to thrive or suffer based on one's ability to know who you are, to know mm -hmm. where you are and what you're supposed to be doing. That was powerful. And I would love to hear you unpack that a little bit further. Yeah. So plants, they generally have to be really aware about where they are. Um, and they have to have a great awareness about what they should be doing because plants like us have a budget. They have an energy budget. So, you know, unless you are Oprah or Bill Gates, you got a monthly budget and you have activities until that money is gone. And then you got to cease activity until your next, in, you know, you get your next money. 
plants have a budget of energy and they have to decide, they really have to prioritize which activities are most important based on where they are. And it's so important for them because where they live is where they live their entire life. So if they're trying to be very active in winter, when there's not enough sun to re replenish their um, energy through photosynthesis, or it's so cold that they can't carry out their activities, that would be wasted energy because it's not going to be fruitful. So plants are really always constantly having to look at the light available around them and decide if there are a few hours of light, it's probably winter and I should be resting. If there are many hours of light, it's likely summer and there's lots of light available to make abundant amounts of sugar. And so then you can be very active. And I think too frequently as humans, we just go all out like it's summer all the time. We don't detect what's going on around us and tune our behaviors. And we definitely don't really t look about what's going on around us and say, is it time to rest? We usually have to be knocked on our feet because we've just pushed ourselves to the limit. And so I think there's a lot to learn from how plants are really in tune with the seasons and tune their behavior to the season. And we have seasons. No, it's not like spring, summer, and fall, but I'm now way too old to be up every night to 3 a.m. like I was 18. I'm in a different season of my life. And I think we have to be aware of what our seasons are in terms of our age, in terms of what else is going on, in terms of our energy levels, our resources, and tune our behaviors to that. That's where the longevity is. And I think that's a powerful lesson that we can learn from plants, as opposed to the ways in which we usually function, which is just to go all out until we exhaust ourselves and completely deplete ourselves and are forced into rest. And we have understood from this pandemic, we don't like to be forced into states. We would rather enter them willingly. And yet that's not how we often pace our lives. Mm, that's powerful. That's good. That's good. So um, you also kind of talk about in your book, um, plants innate ability to adapt to their ever changing environments. Um, and I love the, the continual metaphors um, that you, you make the, the correlation between plants having to adapt and how humans have to adapt to their ever changing environment. So can you kind of just expound on that a little bit further for us um, as well? Yeah, so they adapt in so many different ways. So um, many of us have seen this even in our homes. If we have a plant that we put it in a part of the room where the window's over on the other side, it'll start to adapt and bend towards that window because it needs the maximal access to light. So we see those kinds of things. There are other adaptations that we don't see. So there's a lot of fascinating adaptations that are happening underground with the roots. Um, and one of the uh, things that plants do that I love the most is their ability to transform the environment. So if you plant a plant in soil, and soil looks to us like it's very uniform, but it's very patchy in terms of what's available in terms of nutrients. And so many of us are aware of rust, which is basically a form of iron that's with other, uh, other compounds that makes it solid. Plants need iron, but they need it in a soluble form. And so if you put it in soil and it has iron that's much more locked up like in a rust form, plants can completely transform that environment by excreting compounds that serve as an acid and basically turn that solid into a liquid that it can use. And so it's doing that for itself, but in so doing it, the soil itself becomes richer because now it's bathing in liquid iron. And so to me, that ability that plants have to sense what's going on, to adapt themselves so that they can change the environment for themselves, but also changing the environment for others is really powerful. And I really um, have thought a lot about that just because of my own kind of commitment to uh, living my best life, but doing that in a way that I'm also able to contribute back to community, this term, you know, of reciprocity. And I think plants serve a powerful example in that capacity. Wow, that was, that was huge. Someone asked the question, uh, plants are incredibly slow, but this, they also have an incredible superpower. So what, what, what has working with plants taught you about the nature of time? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, it's slow and fast is all relative. And a lot of the plants that I work with go from being um, a seed to adulthood in a month. And then there are things like this oak tree that I encountered in South Carolina that's 600 years old, right? And so I think what, what I've learned about plants is that there is this incredible range of time. And what's most important is that you understand what your time scale is and what you can accomplish. And so we know what an average lifespan is, but yet we could not live that long. And so I think that too frequently 
we either are living on a pace that we want to get everything done too quick, or we think we never have to get to it. And I do think that thinking about how plants appear slow to us, right? Because um, if you were watching a tree, it seems to be growing very slow, but it's growing at exactly the right pace it's supposed to for its life expectancy. And I think more it's about us trying to figure out what's the right pace for us at what time. It could be different now than it is at a different time. So, you know, it was a different pace when I was trying to raise my son. And now that he's a, an adult, I can adjust my pace. But I do think you can learn a lot about plants, about looking at what they're doing relative to what their lifespan is. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. So the questions are coming in on the chat. Um, so one of the questions says, um, I am not a plant biologist, but someone once told me that plants are able to tell apart if sunlight is blocked by either a rock or by another plant. Depending on the barrier, the plants will react with a different strategy. If this is true, how does it play along with this personal and social terraforming philosophy? That is very true. And it's a great question because that's actually what I study in my lab. Wow. <laughs> so the way, yeah, the way that plants are able to do that is that, um, so plants, yeah, full sunlight has all colors of the rainbow, right? Red through blue, all the way, every color in the rainbow. And if plants are blocked by shade, basically all of those colors are still there. They just see it as going from bright to dim. So plants are both measuring how much light is there, whether they're in bright light versus dim light, but they're also able to measure which colors of light are there. And so if you simply, all the colors are still there and the plants see all the colors, but the amount of light becomes less, you're blocked by something that's not living. It's just completely cutting off the amount of light. When light passes through another plant, the colors of light that are available to it change. So leaves are green because they absorb all the red from the, from the rainbow. So they absorb the red and use that. And then we see green because it's only the green of the rainbow that's passing through. So if plants are in the shade of another plant, they notice that red light is no longer available to them, but the other colors of light are. Whereas if they're in the shade of rock, all the colors are still there. There's just fewer of them. So they're actually measuring whether colors are disappearing or if it's just becoming dim. And that tells them whether there's another living plant next to them or whether they're just being blocked by something like concrete or something else. And here, most people thought that plants were just sitting there. <laughs> no way. <laughs> My goodness. Like it's the whole, the whole world happening. Um, yes. I, I learned plants from an herbalist perspective. So I am always just like enamored when Baranda speaks about plants because it's, you know, it's just taking it to another level of like learning and hearing about what they're doing, you know, so they're not just sitting there. So someone adds, uh, Asia adds, tell us about a time when you met a plant and it changed your life or perspective and why. Oh, I'm so glad. So I actually wrote about this in an article for American Scientists, but um, it was in December of 2018. I was traveling with my sister, one of my sisters who happens to be my best friend and my son. We traveled together and every trip, each of us chooses something we're dying to do. And we all do everything. So even if that other person chooses something you don't want to do, you just got to go along. Well, these two have similar interests. So I get dragged into things that they want to do that I don't want to do. And they were, they're much into African-American history. And we were in Charleston, South Carolina, and they wanted to visit some plantations. And I was having a radical moment. And I said, my people been on plantations. I don't need to be on the plantation. I don't want to go to the plantation, but this is what you chose. So we'll go to the plantation. As we were visiting one plantation, the McLeod Plantation, when we got there, we were doing, you know, travel, uh, look across the land and we went into the cabins of the enslaved people, which were so small and felt heavy. But as we were walking, I encountered a 600 year old tree that's called the McLeod Oak. And as I was standing there with the tree, um, one of the things that we know to be true about plants is that they take up carbon dioxide, right? We exhale carbon dioxide. They take it up. That carbon dioxide together with water in the presence of light is processed into sugars, which gets put into leaves to build leaves, but it's also used to make wood. So as I was standing there with that 600-year-old tree, I became impressed by the fact that some of the wood of that tree held the breaths of our ancestors. The carbon dioxide that they would have exhaled had become a part of the tree. And even though they were on that land by force, 
they were on that land, uh, you know, laboring, having been stolen from their lands because they labored and we were able to have an opportunity. I got to come back to that land free and stand in their presence and standing in the presence of the tree, in the presence of the ancestor. It gave you a different awareness of the opportunities that I've had in life, even though we are still challenged as black Americans in the U.S., it did give me an idea that they had labored and toiled there. Um, they had contributed to that tree. And by standing in the tree, I was standing in their presence, that that tree had borne witness to their experience. Um, and so I think that changed me because even every breath we take has is breathing life into something, whether it's captured in the tree, whether it's captured in the people's lives that we mentor, every breath gets captured and trees do stand as witnesses to the lives that have passed through. And so that tree changed me um, in a lot of ways. Wow, that's powerful. That's powerful. How did you know that the tree was 600 years old? Yeah, so um, they had, the, the, the tour guide had told us there are different ways that you can date trees. Um, and part of it is knowing um, how much wider the trunk gets each year. Um, through growth. And so then if you measure the entire trunk, you can estimate how many years that it is based on the width of the trunk. Wow, that was powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, for those who have just joined us, please feel free to add any questions you want to ask in the chat. Um, uh, we will keep the conversation moving along, talking about the book Lessons from Plants. Um, over the past year, We've seen a huge surge of people gardening and talking about how much it's helped them and have been therapeutic uh, as relation, in relation to the pandemic. Um, you kind of touch on it, of course, in the book, but can you explicitly talk about the ways in which, like, why do plants kind of alleviate us? Like, what's that relationship uh, with plants and that therapeutic aspect on humans? Like, Yeah, so there's actually a lot of literature that plants really serve powerful therapy. And some therapists actually encourage people to grow plants. So I think it's many things. But one of the things that's really stuck with me that it hits is that we as humans do have... Um, despite all of our distractions, we have um, a real joy in taking care of something. And often we care for something and don't see the benefits of it, right? You, if you're raising, a, we were talking about teenagers, sometimes when you're raising a teenager, it is a lot of hard work and you do not see the joy and the reward of this work in the moment. But I think that one of the things that's clear about plants is that as you're taking care of them, a new leaf emerges, right? Or if you've never seen a seed germinate, you put a tiny seed in the soil and days later you see a small plant and then you see the plant make new leaves. There's a real visceral visual connection of seeing the care you put into something grow and, and, and have vigor. And if you do vegetable gardens and that ultimately results in the fruit or the vegetable, plants give you a real payoff for the care investment. And I think that that really feeds a need in us sometimes to care for something. And I think particularly when you're in moments of stress like the pandemic where things can seem very uncertain, there's a lot of joy in knowing that if you put the seed in the soil and you do the proper care, that there's going to be life and you're gonna see the life progress. I think also sometimes there can be really emotional connections. So one of the things, the, the article that I wrote in L was really a reflection on how plants had been um, a beacon of hope for me during the pandemic. So my father passed away um, in October, 2019, right before the pandemic. Um, he was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer and three and a half weeks later, he was gone. And this was in October, 2019. And so I was really trying to figure out how to move forward. And I planted some tulip bulbs in the ground in the fall. And, you know, they sit there over winter. So I kind of was struggling to come back, but I knew my dad would want me to get back out there. So I got back out on the road, started traveling, speaking, talking, and writing. And then the pandemic came in March, 2020. So even though I was trying to get my groove back, the pandemic grounded me in the house. So I was really trying to figure out how to get through grief, how to be on the planet without my father, the fear of what the pandemic was about. And one day I walked out of the house and I saw the leaves of these tulips that I had planted in the ground um, right after my dad's death. And every day that I passed by those tulips, even as we were trying to figure out what the pandemic meant, even as I was trying to figure out how to even be on the planet without him, the fact that those plants were continuing their purpose despite everything that was going on 
really encouraged me that at some point, me and others were going to have to figure out how to do that too. So I think there's this kind of um, hope that can come from taking care of plants, because if you give them the care, they move towards their, their purpose, just undeterminedly move towards their purpose. And I think a lot of people have drawn some hope from that, even in the midst of the pandemic being stuck in their house, but having those plants around them and seeing what the care committed to them can give back to you in terms of beauty and an appreciation for nature and its commitment to plants doing what they do. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back up the chat. Um, you folks asked some questions earlier. Um, someone asked if you have a favorite plant that is native to Michigan? Oh, that's native to Michigan. I was about to tell you one of my favorite plants, but I don't know about plants that are native to Michigan. Well, I, you know, I don't know the names of them, but I am a wildflower hunter. Every spring when winter is breaking and the wildflowers come, I love to go out and see those. I'm sure many of those are native to Michigan because they're in the seed banks. Um, but wildflowers are one of my favorite things to see because they're these small little showy flowers that aren't there for very long, but between winter and when spring and summer are fully set in before all the leaves are in place and their shade, they have this window of opportunity. And I'm always inspired by what they burst out in that window of opportunity, give it their best effort with beautiful flowers when there's opportunity. And that always inspires me um, to think about whether I am paying attention to the windows of opportunity and taking full advantage of them in my own life. Oh, I love that. I love that. I love that. So that was a two in one because uh, someone else asked, what's your favorite plant just in general? So do you want to give it a crack or you feel like you answered it just kind of like- Well, that? one of, I will say one of my favorite plants is actually mimosa. It's that one that almost looks like a fern and people love to bring them to kindergartens because if you touch them, they show they, the leaves fold up. And the thing that I love about that is that most people think plants aren't very sensitive. And that one is a very real reaction of how sensitive plants are to things that are going on around them. Exactly. I love that. I love that. Another uh, earlier question. Someone says, thank you so much for sharing your experiences so far. Can you share some of the joyful aspects of your work or aspects of work that brought unexpected joy? Yeah, I think, you know, some of the most joyful aspects of my work are um, when I'm able to work with students, uh, mentor students, and particularly I love working with undergraduates because um, they're fearless and they are so excited when their experiments work the first time. And so I really do enjoy the opportunity um, to work with students in the lab um, hands on and just get a chance to to try to understand what it is that they want to do with their life and how I may help contribute to that in any way possible. Excellent, excellent. So another question I have for you. So throughout your career, not just in this book, you talk about it in your book, but I've seen it in some of your essays as well. Um, you talk about the uh, plant's ability to collaborate and as opposed to compete. Um, can you kind of expound on that in ways that plants do that and maybe kind of share some examples that it would help humans collaborate um, versus compete? Yeah, so, so plants will compete, um, but even when they compete, they do it differently than humans. So usually when plants compete, for example, if two plants are growing and one of them starts to overshade the other, there's a competition for access to light. But basically what they will do is try to accelerate their growth just so they get access to what they need. They don't try to grow until the other one dies. And humans like to compete to the death. If we compete, I'm not happy until you are obliterated. I'm not just happy enough to get what I need. So I love the fact that plants say, if, if I'm going to put energy into competition, it's just to get what I need. It's not to cause you to cease to exist on the planet. And so plants compete differently. But I think that in terms of you know, examples of collaboration, there are many. Um, one of the ones that I really appreciate is the way that um, in, in dense forests, there's often collaboration between older trees and younger trees, uh, particularly the ones that are related to each other. So plants are able to know when they're growing with kin and not, um, but they will collaborate in ways that the tall tree, if it has access to full sun, and the smaller trees are not yet able to really support themselves, the larger tree will serve as a nurse tree. It will produce sugars 
And then it will transport them through the trunk into the roots and share excess sugars with the younger plants so that they can get going while they're still trying to establish themselves. So that's a form of collaboration in that there's a lot of evidence that that big tree still grows better and healthier through sharing than it would if it just kept all the resources to itself. Because through sharing, the entire soil community and the entire community around those trees is enriched and kept healthy. And so it's better to collaborate than it is just to keep everything to yourself. And I find those kinds of examples really um, informative because we live in societies that really uh, prize the individual over the collective. Um, in some cases. I mean, I happen to be raised in a family and a neighborhood that if one of us had dinner, everybody had dinner, you know, friends would just show up and I'm like, why are they here? My mother said, it's not your business. I bought the groceries. It's not your business. Why they're here. <laughs> I've, I've had that talk too. I've had yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that we have pockets of that, but as a nation, we really do prize individual. You know, that's why we have billionaires and trillionaires probably soon, because it, you're, you know, you looked at as an example if you can hoard all of these things and or you hoard them but decide to dole them out, right? Then you get credit for being a philanthropist. When I'm right, well, shouldn't we talk about your hoarding first before we talk <laughs> about your philanthropy? But I think there are lots of examples in nature where living in a diverse community and or collaborating results in greater outcomes than just focusing on what you can do as an individual. Mm, that's powerful. That's powerful. That's powerful. I'm going to follow it up. We have a question from Michael. Have you ever studied clover as an urban way to take carbon out of the atmosphere? What plants for people, what plants for people that want to replace urban lawns with plants that scrub the atmosphere and support insects? How does clover rank? Yeah, so I haven't personally stu studied clover. I know that there are some studies and part of it depends on where you are. I mean, I think that there are plants similar to clover that work well in different locations. There's a colleague of mine um, named Joanne Corey who does such work out in California where they are looking at plants that is good to grow that may provide some um, amelioration. And although those things are good and I believe plants are amazing, we still have to do some other things to help the plants scrub the atmosphere. We can't just depend upon them to scrub it and we keep dumping. You know, there, I think there has to be some balance, but there are plants that are good for making some local contributions to those kinds of things. Okay, and we have a question from Maya. What plant type or life story development is the most unique to you and why? Hmm. That's an interesting question. You know, it's so hard because they're, they're all, it's like asking about your children. They're all so, you know, have so many contributions to make in their own way. I did spend some time fascinated. Um, I think because they're so different. I spent some time fascinated with um, um, carnivorous plants, you know, that trap insects and, um, and use them as a source of nitrogen perhaps. But there are so many unique things about different plants. It's hard for me to, to choose one that fascinates me the most. Excellent, okay. Um, so my next question for you is in the chapter titled Transformation in your book, you talked about pioneer plants um, yeah. as being the plants that, those are the plants that kind of break through the concrete. Um, those are the plants that um, first appear after a major disaster or a fire. And those are the plants, I'll kind of let you describe, I won't give it away. Um, but can mm -hmm. you one kind of talk about it and kind of correlate again, that relationship to human behavior? Yeah, so I thought a lot about um, the process of succession, which is really what, how does a plant community come back to an environment where it's been decimated? And so a lot of times we think about like an abandoned parking lot, or you think about a place that's after there's been some natu natural disaster, whether that's a volcano or a flood or a fire. And what happens is that the plants have to come back in an order that's defined by what they're capable of. So most of these deserted spaces, particularly let's think about an abandoned parking lot, um, uh, not all plants can grow in that. So plants have to find a crack 
Um, and they're looking for moisture. Basically what they're following is any trace of moisture because a seed needs moisture for the plant to emerge from the seed. And so there are not a lot of plants that could just have moisture, establish themselves and grow healthily. Um, if any of you have gardened, there's some plants that need a lot. They need very rich soils and those kinds of things. So plants that can grow in an environment where there's not rich soil, they, they need very little external resources to be able to produce. And so those plants come in and by growing in the crack of the asphalt, you've often seen that they'll disrupt the asphalt. So roots are very powerful. They don't look very powerful, but any of you who've had a root grow through a pipe in your house know that they're slow, but mighty. And so these original plants, they're very scrappy. They don't need many resources to really start to exert themselves and establish themselves. Sometimes they have a short life, but in their death, the material that's left there becomes organic kind of compounds that can start to build up soil. And after enough of those pioneer plants are able to grow, you start to get a little richer environment that may have a little bit more organic compounds because of the recycling of their lives. And then a second wave of plants can come in who still don't require very much, although they may require more than the first plant. And then over time, it gets rich enough that almost any plant can grow, even those who are born with a silver spoon in their mouth and need every perfect condition. And so I was really fascinated by thinking about this because often I think many of our, I think about learning environments, I'm a professor, many of our learning environments are established so that only those plants that need the very best and all of the resources can grow and thrive. We don't think about whether there are, there's a range of activities. And certainly in the ways that we think about leadership, if we want cultural change, sometimes you need that first leader to be like a pioneer plant who's creative, who doesn't need a lot of resources, but can have major impact. That may not be the same leader you would want later in a particular environment, but usually we just choose the same kind of leader. We don't stop and ask, where are we in the range of cultural change? And do we need someone who's able to make magic with limited resources and have beautiful outcomes and thereby change the environment? We don't often prize that ability to change the environment. And so I think that there's a lot of lessons we can learn about where we are in a trajectory and who we need in that space to be able to thrive and change it towards where we would want it to be. Wow, that was that was amazing. So like, what is it like taking your class? Like, how do people, <laughs> how do people like sign up for your class? Um, like you said uh, before, um, I just want to hear like one. I always like, try to have. Yeah, yeah. I always, whenever I'm the teacher, we're going to have fun. That's what I say. So I always say to people who say, I didn't like biochemistry. I say, you didn't have the right professor. It might still be difficult, but we're going to have fun in the process because biology and biochemistry is too exciting for it to be boring and completely stressful. I just don't believe in that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good God. Like you just made it. You just simplified. I love how you take these complex uh, scenarios and just super simplify them. So also, can you just talk about like some of your mentoring that you've done um, over the years? I've seen your articles about them, but I just love to hear your, your personal testimonies about uh, your mentoring. Yeah, so all of my mentoring is grounded in a perspective that's known as growth-based mentoring, as opposed to deficit-based. So, so much of mentoring that we do in spaces is deficit-based. People come into our spaces, and we immediately try to figure out what their deficits are and fix them into something that we think they're capable of. My perspectives are that anybody who comes into my space can grow. And what is for me to find out is what they already do well that's gonna help them maintain and what they need in their external environment to help them grow more. And so it really is for me a partnership and trying to understand what do they need. And based on the fact that usually um, I might have access to it because I'm a professor, then I look at my role as being a steward of the ecosystem. And if what you need is water, how do I go find the water fountain and a bucket so I can bring it to you until you can figure out where it is on your own? So for me, I'm always looking about how I can help people grow, how I can know what they're interested in and help them achieve that. I think too frequently also men uh, mentoring is about self-affirmation and we want people to play out the same path that we played out. Well, I don't mean it from a, you know, being conceited or anything, but I'm doing Baronda really well. I don't need anybody else to do Baronda. I need them to be the very best version of themselves that they can be. And I can't, that came to me from my mother. When I was young, I thought I was going to be a poet. 
and I was going to be the next Maya Angelou. And she said, Dr. Maya has Dr. Maya handled. We don't need a second rate Dr. Maya Angelou if you can get to second rate, right? We need you to be first rate Baronda. And so my mentoring really is about what is it, although I love what I do and can't imagine doing anything else, what I want to know from people is what would bring them the same joy that my work brings me. And then how do we get you to that joy? Because when you align your passions and your motivations and your joys behind something that the world needs, that's where the power is. And that's what I need people to do. I don't need them to affirm the choices I've made by replaying them. So I really try to figure out what it is I can do to contribute to their growth and what I can do to contribute to getting them to the passion that they have that the universe needs for them to produce. Amazing. That sounds amazing. We all want to take your class, Veronica. So um, before we go, like, tell us, how can people find you? How can people find out more about you? Uh, where can people get this book? Um, yes. Look, yes. Let's that down. I figured. Where can people get this fantabulous book? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So as you said, you can usually find me on Twitter at Baronda M. I'm also on Instagram at Baronda M um, underscore at Baronda underscore M. Uh, But also you can find all the connections to me on my website at BarondaMontgomery.com. And you can get the book anywhere, but I encourage people if they're thinking about ordering it to use something like bookshop.org, which will go through one of your local bookstores to order it. And it's a great way to support local bookstores who we need to persist through this pandemic. And so, you know, you can get it from any big store, but if you have an opportunity to support a local bookstore, and I'm just going to go ahead and say it, if you have a Black bookstore in your local area, support a Black bookstore. Uh, Black businesses need all the support they can get in this moment, local bookstores. And so that's how I can uh, really encourage people to get it. Excellent. Excellent. And I'm going to ask one more question before we go. Sure. Um, Holly Ann asks, has any of your research dealt with plant therapy or plants as therapy? Yeah. So only recently has some of my work taken me into the space um, to ask how plants contribute um, to intentional reflection or mindfulness for people, um, how people's care of plants is allowing them to be more mindful of themselves, but also more mindful about the environment. This is new work. I don't know yet where it's going to take me. Um, and it usually takes me slow because I got a full time job doing other things. But I have started to collaborate with some people and ask some questions about that. Oh, phenomenal. Well, we cannot wait to see what you do next. We look forward to uh, working with you here at Science Gallery, of course. Um, Before we go, I want to give a special thanks to our sponsors for making this happen. Um, MSU FCU and Science Sandbox. Again, special thanks to Michigan State University for um, not only hosting Science Gallery Detroit, but also having Baranda Montgomery. So thank you all for making this possible. Thank you, Baranda. Thank you, audience, for your time. Um, If anyone would like a recap of this chat, do uh, find us on our website, detroit.sciencegallery.com. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I just wanted to thank you because you were one of the first people to be super excited about this book. So thank you for who you are. Oh, thank you. Listen, (laughs) representation is everything in this space. Um, When I first got into herbalism, um, I was, it was like looking for people who look like me were few and far between. So like when I found you, I was like, ah! She's my Oprah. She's my Oprah. (laughs) Thank you so much. Take good care of yourself and everyone else tonight. Thanks so much. Yes. Thank you. Take care. Bye.